Welcome, Bun Runner. Recently, there has been a lot of talk over the fact that Grand Theft Auto V has now been remade and re-released three different times across three separate generations of console. A lot of people have moaned that it's a lazy cash grab that shows the current state of the video game industry with re-releases and remasters of old games taking up a pretty big portion of the market, especially if you own a Nintendo Switch. But the fact is that this is nothing new at all. This kind of behaviour has actually been going on since the early 80s, as this video is about to explain. In fact, you probably didn't know how rife remaking games was back then, but in this list we won't just be talking about games that were remade and re-released twice, we'll be focusing on the ones that really took the piss by being published on three separate occasions in an adapted form. So let's all sing together. Three is the magic number. So let's start with probably the most obscure and little known story on this list, although it really shouldn't be, as Dandy is an incredibly innovative and historically important game. Released in 1983 for the Atari 8-bit computers via the Atari Program Exchange, or APX as it was better known, John Palovich's Dandy became an almost instant hit. Famed for being one of the very first games to offer simultaneous four-player gameplay, as well as a unique level designer, it provided the direct inspiration for the 1985 Atari arcade game Gauntlet. In fact, the designer of that coin-op, the legendary Ed Logg, is quoted as saying that he originally created Gauntlet as a sequel to Dandy. Now, the release of Gauntlet remains extremely important to this whole story, as it directly influenced what happened next. In 1986, Activision UK's spin-off label, Electric Dreams, was looking on with envious eyes at the huge piles of cash being generated by US Gold and their home ports of the Atari arcade game. They were obviously pretty smart and well aware of Gauntlet's relationship to Dandy, so they promptly licensed the game from Palovich himself and set about remaking the game for the Amstrad CPC, Commodore 64 and Sinclair ZX Spectrum. The resulting remake of Dandy ended up being so close in design to Gauntlet that Electric Dreams promptly faced a lawsuit from both Atari Games and US Gold, which was soon settled out of court. A few years after the release of Gauntlet in 1988, Jack Trammell's Atari was finding it tough to get new games onto their consoles in the wake of Nintendo's draconian third-party licensing agreements, which meant that anyone who signed up could only release games for their best-selling NES console. Not put off by this, Atari got creative, looking to the home computer market rather than the arcades for inspiration. It wasn't long before their eyes were drawn to Dandy, a game they had previously published on disc for their own home computers. The links to Gauntlet, which was still riding high thanks to the many home ports, were quickly identified and the folk at Atari had an idea. So Atari approached prolific US coding shop Sculptured Software to produce new versions of Dandy for the Atari XE game system as well as the Atari 2600 and 7800 consoles. They asked that the game be updated slightly to look and play much more like Gauntlet. The name was also changed to the far more foreboding Dark Chambers as they decided that Dandy sounded a bit stupid. But John Palovich was still credited as the game's designer on the title screen. Atari even went as far as promoting the game to the press as the prequel to Gauntlet. Next up we have undoubtedly the oldest game to feature on this list in the form of early arcade maze game Head On. One of the first titles to be produced after the merger of Sega's US division and arcade innovators Gremlin Industries, Head On is actually credited as being one of the direct influences in the design and creation of Pac-Man. The comparisons are easy to see too, as both are set inside a maze where you collect dots and try to avoid a chasing enemy. But in Head On you control a little race car that can switch between five different lanes at any of the four available junctions and must avoid a single rival. A simple but fun game, it was first released in 1979 and proved to be a huge hit. As well as spawning numerous unofficial clones like Exidy's Crash, Konami's Fastlane and most famously Atari's Dodgem, 
It was also followed by a sequel called Head On 2. This new game is largely identical, with the only real difference being the ability to play against a human opponent rather than just a CPU. But that's not all, because the game was also licensed to two different Japanese coin-op companies. First, there is the Iron version of Head On, which made several quite notable changes, including a different screen ratio, alternative colour palette, and most interestingly of all, it added the letters from Iram into the maze. Driving over a letter changed the colour, and if the colour of all four letters matched when you finished the round, you got a big bonus. After Iram's licence expired, it was picked up by Nintendo, who made a slight name change to Head On N, and removed the new letters feature, but kept the look the same as Iram's iteration. This was one of the very first arcade games produced by Nintendo, and so serves as an important historical moment in their past too. For the next story, I actually have a double whammy, because not only was the game remade on three separate occasions in its commercial form, but it was also remade several times in homebrew form for one specific format, as I'll go on to explain. The sequel to the hugely popular platformer Manic Miner, and another creation of the video game Enigma that is Matthew Smith, Jet Set Willy was first released in 1984 by software projects before promptly being ported to a host of other formats. It was followed by a sequel in Jet Set Willy 2 The Final Frontier just a year later. Well, I say sequel, Jet Set Willy 2 was actually nothing more than a revision of the original game that fixed some game-breaking bugs and added another 40 rooms to explore. It was this game, rather than the original Jet Set Willy, that served as a source for many of the subsequent ports to other systems, which often dropped the two from the name. In 1992, not long before they closed down completely, software projects ported Jet Set Willy 2 to the Atari ST and Amiga. Whilst the former got a highly authentic port of the game that didn't do anything to exploit the 16-bit capabilities of the computer, the latter got a complete remake. The Amiga version of Jet Set Willy was similar in gameplay style, but had a completely different look, not just in the design of the sprites and backgrounds, but also because it now scrolled. A lot of people felt that this new version lost a lot of the magic of the original, and felt like just another generic platformer. But as I already alluded to, this isn't quite the end of this story. In 1986, the much maligned Tynesoft released a port of Jet Set Willy for the Atari 8-bit computers. Initial impressions of the game are very good with its bold, colourful visuals and stunning soundtrack by Rob Hubbard, which is still credited as one of the best on the system but closer inspection reveals some serious issues with the gameplay that will lead to a lot of frustration. So in 2007, prolific Polish programmer Krzysztof Dudek decided to remake the game, using the original ZX Spectrum version as a template, whilst keeping the amazing pokey music intact. This turned out to be a much better port that was only let down by the lack of colour, an unfortunate sacrifice of the graphics mode used to recreate the Spectrum visuals accurately. With this last point in mind, another new homebrew version of the game was released in 2019 by Terence Darby, who had previously delivered a stunning homebrew version of Smith's previous game, Manic Miner for the Atari 8-bit. Jet Set Willy 2019 proved to be the ultimate version for the Atari computer, with its new graphics, amazing music and authentic gameplay. Now the story of the many home conversions of Frogger is already pretty contentious. In fact, I wrote about the story of how the Atari 2600 console got two official ports of the game in a script I produced for Larry Bundy's Fact Hunt series back in 2017, as well as the cut-down version of the Dandy Story 2. But after further research, I was simply astounded to discover that there are in fact three official versions of the classic Konami arcade game for the Atari 8-bit computers. There is actually a very interesting story behind this too, some of which makes sense, and some that very much doesn't. Now, Atari 8-bit owners seem to be most familiar with the excellent cartridge version by Parker Brothers, which has been covered extensively on YouTube already, but less people seem to know that Sierra Online released their own port on both disc and tape the year before. 
This is because whilst Parker held the rights to produce cartridge versions of the game, the magnetic media rights were sold separately to Sierra. The Atari 2600 received two different versions of the game for similar reasons, Parker on cartridge and another on tape for the Starpath Supercharger add-on. So where does this third version come in, I hear you ask? Well, Sierra actually contracted two different programmers in Chuck Benson and John Harris to do the conversion for them. And what do you know? They both delivered. So rather than choose just one version to release on disc, they actually put them both out with a simple sticker on the box stating the author's name to differentiate them. Now there's a sticking point for all the avid collectors. I'm sure you're now left wondering which version is the best. Well, they are both bloody great actually, but the Chuck Benson port just about grabs the honours thanks to its amazing simultaneous two player mode, which very much adds a new dimension to the game. I think a lot of people could have predicted this final entry, but certainly the most well known example and also the most prolific one, because it's fair to say that Capcom's iconic brawler has been remade a lot more than three times. It's also safe to say that the original Street Fighter 2 coin up was a pretty big deal when it was first released back in 1991. Despite the first Street Fighter game not being very good, this much improved sequel totally revolutionised the one-on-one -on -one fighting game genre and set the template that all future titles in this category would be judged by. The key innovations included bonus stages, boss battles, taunt screens and those outlandish special attacks. Capcom were pretty keen to capitalise on that success and so came back the year after with a revised Champion Edition, which is actually the one that most people seem to best remember. This was then updated again rather quickly to the Turbo Hyper Fighting Edition, with this new subtitle alluding to one of the best new features, a much faster speed setting. But by far the best update to both these revisions was the ability to play as the four bosses in Vega, Bullrock, Sagat and of course M. Bison. You could also both choose the same fighter in two player mode now too. The game was then updated massively to form Super Street Fighter 2 in 1993 with its extended roster of characters, new visuals, improved audio and host of other upgrades to the gameplay too. Rather predictably, this was soon upgraded to a turbo version less than a year later. Then we waited nearly 10 years for another revision with the 2003 release of Hyper Street Fighter 2 the Anniversary Edition for Arcade and PlayStation 2. Then, Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo HD Remix, which actually sounds like a parody title, was released for Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 in 2008, and then most recently of all, the Nintendo Switch received Ultra Street Fighter 2, the final challenges in 2017, as one of its earliest titles. I'm pretty sure that won't be the last we hear of Street Fighter 2 either. And that rounds up my look at five games that were remade three or more times. Can you think of any other classic games that fit the criteria that I could have included in this list? Or do you actually like to collect all these different variations? I'd also love to hear the thoughts and views of my audience, so please get typing in that comment section. Before I go though, I must thank all of my loyal followers for continuing to support my channel and make videos like this possible. However, I must give special thanks to the following patrons in particular for their much appreciated pledges. Mitchell Valentino, Neptune, Seth A. Robinson, Carl Olsen, Dos Gamerman, Tiago Piero Dos Santos Silva, and Electron Star Collapse. If you also want to help support all my creative endeavours, including this YouTube channel, then please go and check out my Patreon right now. You can get access to a host of extra content, including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights, and much more besides. I've been the lad, I thank you for watching, and I'll see you all again for another video very soon.